Back in 2012, the British newspaper The Observer held a stock picking contest. It was won by a contestant named Orlando. Orlando beat students from the John Warner School and a group of three financial experts who were, of course, presumed to be the likely winners at the end of the year's contest. But the most intriguing thing about him winning the contest is that Orlando was a cat who made his selections not by quantitative assessments, value investing, stock charts, but by smacking his toy mouse around a grid of numbers corresponding to different stock options. Now, some people would take this anecdote and say that it's proof that the market is in entirety completely random and that there's no point in even trying to beat it. But the perspective I want to take and discuss is this one. Even if you know what you are doing, in any given short time frame, you can underperform, even underperform a cat. Let's give these three experts the benefit of the doubt and say that they actually are successful long-term investors who have a great track record. Like, let's pretend that they're three people you know, you know, Buffett and Lynch and Munger, let's say, and they still get beat by a cat. In any given year, that can happen. You can lose to an index or random chance, or in this case, a ginger molly feline. There are many reasons for that, be they macro factors, uh, unforeseen challenges to your companies, or just the sheer randomness that there is in the stock market as a complete organism, which is a concept I do personally believe in. And it's very well explained in what I feel is one of the best investing books of all time, Bert Malkiel's A Random Walk Down Wall Street. I've checked that out if you haven't. But losing to Orlando in a year doesn't by itself mean that these investors were worse at their job than a cat. Even Warren Buffett has had years where he's underperformed the S&P, including a handful of the most recent years, probably over the last decade. But as a whole, over the years, he has blown away not just the index, but dang near every other investor who's ever existed. Now, while you and I are obviously not Warren Buffett, the fact that we can underperform from time to time does not mean we should give up on trying altogether. Coming off of an insane 2021, and honestly, a pretty dang strong 2020 as well, uh, in 2021, the S&P had a return of 28.7%. Now, I'm willing to bet that many individual stock pickers watching this video feel like they would have been better off indexing last year. I know I had that feeling from time to time. I Personally, I underperformed the S&P last year by just under 3%. And although I would argue that my holdings were a much safer basket of stocks than the composition of the S&P 500. Thus far, SPY is down 8%. My portfolio is up 4.6%. Now, obviously, it's only been one quarter, but my point is always keep in mind the bigger picture. Last year, I underperformed, but this year, I'm way overperforming. And just because at the end of last year, I, I actually underperformed in 2020 by 1% as well. So let's say at the end of two years of underperforming the market, I was just like, hey, screw it. Why am I even trying? I would be missing out on this year as well. And again, I kept in mind, it's a crazy bull market. There's going to be times where I'm not going to be able to match the insanity without taking big risks. And I'm okay with that. And that's all I'm trying to get you to focus on is it be okay with it. Uh, wise investing is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And Again, just consider whether your strategy assumed less risk than other ones. If you have a plan, knowledge, but most of all discipline, then you can over multiple years beat the index and maybe even your pets too. Something I find helpful, not just in investing, but in life in general is take some time now to reevaluate what happened in the recent past and figure out what you can learn from that experience. How can you implement any necessary changes moving forward? For example, if you're a newer investor and you bought into some of these really high price to sales stocks in 2021, you probably learned the lesson that valuations actually do matter from time to time. And that if you're new enough, that's a completely foreign concept, but you found out the hard way that that can be the case. Many names took 50% hits in 2021. Uh, 
Pinterest, ArcG, Palantir, Neo, off the top of my head. If I find think of some other ones, I'll toss them up here. But their underlying fundamentals largely remained unchanged, at least the ones that I'm familiar with. And they nothing happened other than they just shot up to insanely high valuations. And now we're coming back to reality. So figure out for yourself, how will you avoid making that same mistake moving forward? Where is the line for you where the growth that you're assuming will be you know, so high in the future without you grossly overpaying for that growth today? What multiple are you needing to wait for the stock you know, price to hit? Or are you assuming too high of growth cagers in your projections? Figure out where your problem lies and then set yourself hard rules to follow moving forward. The chances are, though, a lot of you may not be using any form of valuation model before buying a stock or, the again, the, maybe the assumptions you're using are too high. But m most likely, the lesson you probably need to learn is patience. Buying something like Pinterest at an over 100 PE did not interest me myself last year. Despite me liking the company when I was kind of doing some brief research into them, I liked them a lot as a whole. Now that the price has dropped and the forward PE is about 25, I'm thinking now would be the opportune time for me to do a lot of research and projections for a potential and more rational investment. Uh, PayPal, Lamb Research, and some other ones have now fallen basically in half, and now they're interesting me. So as you're seeing in 2022 now, it's not that you can't own great companies. You need to be patient and disciplined enough to wait for those great companies to come down to valuations that make sense for your desired returns. And you need to be okay with the, with, with the sheer thought that if the stock never falls to that point, you know, your target PE or EV to EBIT or EV to EBITDA or whatever it is, that you'll be okay never owning it in your life. That you would be better off never buying it than you would buying it at too high of a valuation. You know, the word FOMO or term FOMO, whatever, has really been misused a lot over the last couple of years. It seems to be everybody's throwing it out there. But I feel like this is an act, the actual example of what fear of missing out is. Do not fear missing out on a stock so much that you buy it at a high valuation. You're better off never owning it and putting that money into an investment that makes a lot more sense than to buy it at nosebleed valuations. Now, maybe on the opposite side of the spectrum, maybe the lesson you learned over 2020 and 2021 was that the market can, in fact, just continue to go up. If you stuffed your cash in, into your mattress or buying just gold and silver over the last 12 to 18, 24 months waiting for another market crash, you've missed out on a monumental year and a half, really, for equities. And not only that, your cash lost like 10% purchasing power due to inflation, depending on you know which inflation metrics you actually personally believe in. So if that's the case, then maybe your takeaway should be that you're being too conservative in general, or maybe you need to find other ways to put some of this cash to use instead of just holding cash, waiting for another market crash. Maybe you need to learn an option selling strategy uh, that can return you a respectable amount for, you know, for a risk reward benefit. But pull up your trades for 2021 and look at your portfolio history. See what choices you made and why. And what can you improve upon for 2022? Make yourself an Excel sheet for tracking your trades and a section for notes for yourself. That's the most important part about why you made decisions at the time and throw some reminders on there for yourself about how can you avoid the mistakes you made in 2021. Matter of fact, let me just, I'm just going to make you want a basic one real quick here. Okay, here I've got, I just threw this together real quick, so it's pretty basic, but this is an example of something similar to what I use. And I've got you, you've got your tickers, the date you bought, how many shares, what cost was each share average, and then the date you sold, how many shares, how many did you sell, or, you know, did you what price did you sell at, 
your profit and loss in dollars, your profit and loss in percentage, and you can use this to track your taxes that you're going to owe, your capital gains at the end of the year as well. Now, if you hover over your tax here, I've put in a little tool tip for you, but um, I've got it set up for the 22% short-term gains, capital gains rate. If you need to change that, so I tell you right there, I've got at 22% income tax bracket. If you need to adjust that, just go in the formula and change the 0.22 to whatever yours is. So for example here, this one it's 0.22. You would just change that, say your 0.28, just change it to 0.28 and then drag the formula down for all of your trades. But anyways, I, I bet most of you probably would 0.22. So and then after the trade is complete, put in how many days was the length of that trade? 4.1 to 4.28, 27 days. And then I've got it set up to give you an annualized return of what that trade would have netted you. But the most important part here, aside from the taxes, which is nice, is net is these notes and links to your valuations. So here you would put notes as to why are you buying this? Most importantly, what I personally do is I put it, I make Excel sheets for every stock that I'm valuating. And in here I put links into my other Excel sheets that I have pulled me to there and then I can see all of my notes and exactly in detail, you know, tons of research showing why I feel a stock is, is valued at this, at what projections was I using, blah, 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 since you can fit a lot more than you can in this line. But these are notes to yourself. Why did you buy it? When did you, when do you plan on selling it or what changed all of a sudden that made you sell it? Whatever, something to help you so that next quarter, or next year, more importantly, more likely, then you can reflect and figure out where are you going right, where are you going wrong, and make slight tweaks to your trading plan moving forward. And then if you scroll down to the bottom here, um, you've got, so this is your running total of your capital gains tax you're gonna owe. So every trade you complete, it's tallying up your profit and loss, or tallying up the taxes you're gonna owe on those profits and loss. If you lose, it's going to subtract from your capital gains. And then this is just a running total of dollar amount for your for yourself. But this is your taxes right here. Also, if you get any dividend payouts while you're holding a stock, you can uh, enter those in individually here. Anyway, do something like this so that next year or next quarter, whenever you want to be regularly evaluating yourself, you have a way to to track what was in your mind at the time that you made these trades. Look, I don't know your personal investing methods and goals. All I'm saying is there's always something you can improve upon in investing and just in life in general. And at the start of a fresh year or fresh quarter is the best time to do it. But don't beat yourself up too bad. Don't be in a rush to feel like you have to have everything figured out early. I always remind myself, I'm gonna be investing for the rest of my life, several decades. As long as I continue to learn and improve my process and my understanding just year after year, I will hit my goals. I'm confident of that and I'm patient enough to wait for it, not have to rush and beat myself up in the meantime. Much like our investments themselves, you know, our knowledge and our skills compound over the years, not just your returns. But your goals and your methods should be what works out best for your, your risk tolerance, your financial needs, and the amount of time that you want to spend learning. And that last point brings me around to a quick channel update. I will be doing fewer short-term value plays and option selling. Uh, and I will be doing a lot more just very long-term buy and holds over the next couple years, even maybe just indexing for the most part because my personal situation is changing. Uh, I have another baby girl on the way and I'm wanting my wife to be able to take some time off. I've worked for a few years to spend time with them before they start school and I'm gonna need to work a lot of overtime to make that happen. And I've also recently just, I've had some close deaths in the family and I've also Personally, me, I've had some serious health issues recently that have just kind of kicked me in the butt and, you know, reminded me that I need to be spending my time and focus on the present and on my kids and just spending time with my wife and just enjoying life 
Um, I feel like I've been overworking a lot lately and this is kind of slapping me in the face and, you know, making me focus. So that means less time for investing research in YouTube. You will get even less videos from me for the next couple of years, but I do still want to keep this channel alive and I will still keep improving with every video. Down the line, as my girls continue to get older, um, I'm planning on more videos on teaching kids money lessons and setting them up for long-term financial success. I already have some ideas drawn up for that and a little bit of footage. Uh, and this is a good time for me to just say I appreciate all of you guys' YouTube comments and Discord messages, emails, uh, thanking me or giving me advice on how to grow the channel. And guys, the truth is I'm not dumb. If I wanted to have a ton of subscribers, I know that I would just crank out low quality POS videos every day like most of the financial YouTubers do. And that's not what I'm here to do. I don't need YouTube. I'm not trying to sell you something. I'm not making a penny off of this. I don't need to make a penny off of this. I have a good day job that I enjoy very much. And I'm just trying to share ideas in my spare time. And, and these are concepts and advice that I just wish someone had shared with me 20 years earlier, at least 10 years ago. And if anybody, if I can help one person just get in that investing mindset earlier in their life, then all this time has been spent. I don't have a lot of money to give back to the community and others, but I do feel like I have time and knowledge to give back. And so that's what I've been trying to do and will keep trying to do. And uh, there's always something new to learn in finance. That's what I enjoy about it. There's new ways. Uh, I'm trying to just better myself on evaluating a company's management, how businesses run just in detail. And having a YouTube channel, I feel like gives me an outlet to let us all grow together. I, I don't have all the answers. I don't want to have all the answers. I enjoy finding the answers. And this, like, it, it's, I forget where I learned, I heard the, somebody else use the phrase of, of learning in public. Like, that's what I enjoy about this YouTube is I can watch myself back in the day or look at my old notes from years ago and just see myself advancing and use that also to figure out how to improve myself and to make sure that I am improving and keep myself honest, I guess is the way to look at it. But my priority is my girls and my personal life. And, um, I promise you will get a video every few months. And when you get a video, it'll be worth your while to watch. It will not just be some generic crap that most YouTube channels are pumping out all the time. So stay subscribed for the long haul. I am working on some more Excel sheets. Uh, to give you multiple methods and tips when evaluating single stocks. Actually, I'll bring, um, I just did an Alibaba one recently, and I'll bring that one up for you here. Here's an example. I personally, I use EV to EBIT a lot. I've got a PE option. I've got, like I said, four or five different options here. But on the left-hand side, you'll put in your notes as you're going along. And then over each of these, I have a little tool tip where if you hover over, it's going to give you tips. What am I looking at? Why? Where can you find it easily for free if possible? Um, and then you go in and you input your numbers. And so you got your cases for the margins. And it, so it's just using revenue projections and then your margin. So if you're doing um, an EV to EBIT here, it's going to look at your EBIT margin. If you were doing the PE, it's going to look at your net income margin. Your, this is where you would put your projections. You choose whether you want to do a 5 or a 10. And I'll make a video specifically showing you how to, to use this tool. But I've made it with the, with the little tool tips here to make it pretty self-explanatory and a good like beginner to intermediate step. A little bit better and more in-depth than a generic DCF. Back here, this is where you'll put some of the more qualitative information. You will do all this research before you would go in and input your projections into the quantitative. So you go through looking at management, how is their re revenue broken down, pros and cons of the company, how are they going to grow in the future, how have they grown in the past, is that possible, you know, the way that they grew in the past, is that possible for the future? A whole lot of, however, again, however in-depth you want to get is up to you. And then here's some peer comparison notes you can look up and input. And as you put it in, it's going to tell you which one's the highest, which one's the lowest of the peers. So all this good stuff. So you can look forward to a video on that within the next couple months after I finish it all the way. 
In the meantime, if you want to join my free Discord, we're running a stock competition this year, very similar to the one that Orlando won. Uh, we randomly generated 50 stocks from the S&P 500, and we each chose 10 from those 50 we, th we think will outperform in 2022. Uh, but we also added pets, toddlers, spouses into the competition who chose their 10 stocks through random chance. Or maybe like my toddler, I had her pick hers using a system that I made up with her little flashcards. So if you want to join us, there's a link in the video description. I'll probably send the winner a prize. Uh, maybe a t-shirt that says like, I beat a dog, a cat, and a toddler, a two-year-old in a stock picking contest or something like that. But good luck in building wealth for yourself and for your family.